Lord God, this morning, more than anything, we need your presence. God, we need to be found in you. God, we know that we are sinful people. We are weak people. We are nothing without Jesus. And so as we open your word this morning, we just ask you, we beg you to lead us to a a deeper, more aware sense of your love for us and the confidence that we can have in you, God. Because you are our king. You are the God that we look to, that we trust, the God that we love. So we invite you to come and lead us now as we open your word together. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is what we know from the blunt clarity of Jesus. If you are a human being and you live in this world, then great distress and suffering are inevitable. Tribulation is unavoidable. Loss, pain, and death is the guaranteed future for all of us. And yet, we can be people with heart. We can be people who have guts, people who are unafraid. The church can shine forth under the pressure of tribulation. But why? Is it because we are stronger than our troubles? Is it because we are smarter than our troubles? Is it because we are tougher than our troubles? By no means. The church can shine forth. We can be strong because Jesus has overcome the world. Now, fear is not bad. Fear is simply the natural response to the threat of losing something that we desire. It is a mechanism for responding appropriately to danger. But the ways in which we manage our fears are typically bad. We all manage our fears in basically one of four ways. We are all, if you will, one of these four types of people. Uh, The first person, we'll call him the Stoic. The Stoic has learned to just suck it up, to deal with it, to take life as as it comes. They don't feel pain, but it comes at the high cost of not feeling joy either. There are no ups because there are no downs. They have trained themselves to see the whole world in the color gray. Let's call the second person the cynic. The cynic believes that trouble is the product of everyone else's impotence. If everyone was as smart and as skilled as they were, there would be no trouble. But since they must live in this world full of idiots, they suffice to mock, joke, and belittle others. Uh, The next person we will call the panic. The panic feels like their trouble in their life is going to steal away everything that they love. Worry, overthinking, and paranoia drives this person to the point of exhaustion. They feel the full weight of solving their problems on their own. And then our final person is the addict. The addict believes that trouble must be escaped at all cost. They idolize comfort, but they find it in all the wrong places. What they find comfort in kills them and usually destroys anything near them. Now, I don't know how you respond to trouble, but this is what I do know. That every attempt to manage our fear in these ways is driven by sin and self-reliance. In effect, instead of trusting that Jesus has overcome the world, we believe that we must overcome the world. But here's the grace of it all. Instead of whacking us upside the head or making us feel stupid, God makes himself utterly available to us. He humbles himself and comes down into our trouble. He gives us the resources we need to manage our troubles in ways that glorify Him. See, God is so glorified in His people when they stand firm in Christ in the midst of tribulation. 
So tribulation is the time for the church to shine. Trouble is our stage. It is in the face of death. That is when the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes the power to the body of Christ. Isn't this what Jesus was preparing us for when he said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world? I believe that when Christians are that hopeful and that joyful and that unfazed by the troubles in their lives, God is glorified and people begin to ask about who this Jesus is who we love more than life itself. Now, God knows that we are fearful and that we are sinful. He knows that we have a hard time believing that Jesus has overcome the world. And he is so patient with us. That is why he has graciously given us his word. Psalm 46, where we're going to be this morning, exists to arouse in us an undaunted confidence in his gospel, in his plan, and in his very being. God won't be moved. And if we are in him, then we won't be moved either. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Psalm 46, and we're going to read that together. Psalm 46. For the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah, set to the Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, Though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so I'm going to assume today that because you are a human being and because you live in this world, that you are in trouble. So here is our question moving forward. How does our God help us to live for His glory in our greatest times of trouble? The first thing we see from verses 1 through 3 is that our God is filled with compassion. That our God is filled with compassion. Compassion is feeling for someone in trouble in such a way that makes us want to do something about it. Now, many of us really struggle with compassion. It's almost like we are allergic to other people's problems. When people call us for help, we get annoyed. When people keep calling us for help, we get worn out. And for some of us, our lack of compassion goes so deep that rather than simply feeling indifferent towards other people who are in trouble, we actually become judgmental towards them. We think, how stupid are they? Did they not realize that this was going to happen? Now, thanks be to God that he is nothing like that. He is not allergic to our problems. He is not too busy for us. When we come to God in our trouble, he isn't shaking his head at us. He isn't scoffing at our stupidity. And he isn't planning his I told you so speech. God's heart is so filled with compassion towards his people 
that when we find ourselves in times of trouble, He can't help but come and help us. And that is why Psalm 46 says here in these first three verses, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. The whole world seems to be turned upside down in, in this psalm. Everything is crashing down. Even the strong and immovable things like the mountains are trembling. And yet, despite this total upending of life, the song says, we will not fear. So is this the stoic or the cynic or the panic or the addict talking? What reason is given for our ability not to fear when life is crashing down all around us? It is God and God alone. This song tells us what we can expect from God in the midst of our greatest trouble. And what we can expect from God is that He will be a very present help to us. His help comes in abundance. He does not withhold one ounce from His people. God puts Himself at our service. He is in our trouble, a very present help to his people. We get to see the heart of God fully and completely personified in Jesus Christ. If you are wondering about how Jesus feels about you when you are in trouble, then I want you to observe his compassionate heart in Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. It says, Now when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. Jesus had just found out that his cousin John had been beheaded. Beheaded. So he tries to get away to a secluded place to, to process what had happened and to pray. He wanted some alone time with God. But before he can even catch his breath, a large crowd comes rushing upon him, looking for help and looking for healing. Now, how would we respond in that moment? What would be our gut reaction as we saw the crowds coming our way? But without a huff, without a puff, without one ounce of annoyance, the text says that Jesus felt compassion for them and healed their sick. When Psalm 46 says, therefore, we will not fear though, though means despite the fact. Despite the fact that our economy is volatile, we will not fear. Despite the fact that we aren't currently meeting as a church, we will not fear. Despite the fact that we feel distant from those that we love the most, we will not fear. And why? Why will we not fear? Because God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. See, God's heart is so attractive to people in trouble that He literally promises everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God is so far from being busy or annoyed or wondering why we can't get our act together in the midst of our trouble that he actually comes up and shows up in our troubles, right there in the midst of our mess. So some of us need to fill in the blank with our own troubles. If God is this compassionate, if he is this available to me in times of trouble, then I will not fear even though blank. You, you fill in the blank. What fear in your life can the compassionate heart of God blow to smithereens? So if somebody were to say to you, how does your God help you in time of trouble? You could say, well, first of all, His heart is filled with compassion towards me. But that is not all. Knowing God's heart is important, but there is more. So to demonstrate how God helps us, this song paints two different scenes for us, which brings us to our next point. Point number two, 
our God makes us immovable. Our God makes us immovable from verses 4 through 6. And let's read that together again. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. This first scene that we are brought to is a city. It is the city of God. And the city of God will not be shaken. So what resources are found in the city that make it immovable? From where do its citizens draw their strength? The first thing that this song points us to is that the city of God has a river. A river in the life of a city means sustenance, life, and satisfaction. So what keeps the church alive? What sustains the church? The all-satisfying river which flows through us is nothing other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, became a man. And he lived the perfect life that you and I could not live. And he died the death that we deserve. But then he rose triumphantly over the grave, over sin and hell and Satan. That is the good news of the gospel. And the streams of this gospel river, streams like regeneration, which means that we are given new life through the Holy Spirit, and streams like reconciliation, which means that even though we were enemies of God, He has called us friends. And streams like adoption, which means that even though we were orphans, even though we were far from God, He has made us His very children. And streams like perseverance of the saints, which means that God Himself has made Himself responsible for getting us to the finish line. It is the streams of this gospel river that are enough to make the city of God glad in all things. When the world is falling apart all around us, we have a river in the gospel whose streams give us more reasons to be joyful then our circumstances give us reasons to be downcast. The second thing that this song points us to is that the city of God is holy. God is holy, so by de facto, His city and all its inhabitants must be holy as well. And what makes the city of God such an amazing place is that we don't have to qualify ourselves to be its citizens. God qualifies us as a gift he makes us holy through the gospel. Our holiness is the holiness of Jesus. Our holiness is his perfect life and his sacrificial death. That means that the only way we could be stripped of our holiness is if the holiness of Jesus could be stripped from him. The only way that God could, be, could begin to see his people as sinners is if God began to see Jesus as a sinner. And that will never happen. The third thing that this song points us to is that the city of God has God in her midst. All our comfort, all our confidence, and all our courage comes from this one fact, that God is in our midst. Are you currently scared for the church? The church will no sooner be moved than God himself will be moved. The church will no sooner lose her glory than God himself will lose his glory. The city of God is not moved one inch by the raging and roaring of the kings of, the, of this world because God himself is not moved by one inch by anything ever. A few years ago, someone in my family was moving and they bought one of those uh, U-Haul trailers, not, not the big truck kind, but the kind you attach to the back of your car and they spent all day uh, carrying boxes and furniture outside and packing the trailer. You know, they were trying to just find something to put in every nook and cranny and fill every square inch of the, the small trailer that they had. In the late afternoon, it was time to leave. But when they went to try to put the trailer on the trailer hitch, it was too heavy. 
They called out a few neighbors to come and help, but even with three grown men, they could not get the trailer up on the hitch. The trailer by itself would have been easy to move, but with all that weight in it, it had become immovable. So they had to spend hours unpacking the trailer until finally it was light enough to put it on the hitch. The city of God is immovable because the eternal weight of glory is in her midst. The only way to move the city of God would be to empty the city of God. And there is no power, no trouble, no life-shattering situation that could ever move God out of his city. And if God is in the city, and we are in the city, then we can't be moved. The fourth thing that this song points us to is that the city of God has hope. All this trouble, all the raging and tottering of earthly kingdoms cast a dark shadow in the world. But the city of God knows this, that soon and very soon the morning will dawn. Light is going to break over the horizon. The darkness which surrounds the city will melt away. A new day is coming, and that new day will last forever. As Revelation 22.5 tells us, And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have any need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. This is our eternal future. And finally, as if this is not enough, the city of God also has an invincible weapon, God's powerful voice. Uh, Don't you just love verse 6? The nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered, he raised his voice, the earth melted. The word of God moves in power. When God's word goes out, it triumphs. God accomplishes his mission through his word. God's voice is awakening Stoics. God's voice is softening cynics. God's voice is calming panics. And God's voice is comforting addicts. As a part of my study this week, I learned that the reformer Martin Luther wrote one of the more famous hymns of the church based on Psalm 46, entitled, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which is the title of our sermon this morning. I love this stanza about the power of the Word of God. Listen to how Luther put it. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed His truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. This is our God. His word is our power, and his word is our victory. The only question left is how does one become a citizen of this city? Does entrance into the city of God come because of what family we are born into? No. Does entrance into the city of God come because of what country we are born in? No. The only entrance into the city of God is faith in the Son of God. As Galatians 3, 26-29 says it so clearly, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. The city of God might as well be called the city of Christ because the entrance, the initiation, the river, the holiness, the stability, the unity, the hope, the word, it is all Jesus. Entrance into the immovable city of God is faith in the all-sufficient Son of God. What are we waiting for? So, if somebody says to you, okay, big deal, your God is filled with compassion towards you, 
But what does he actually do for you? You can say, he made me a citizen of his city, and his city cannot be moved. But that is not all. God is so gracious that he wants us to know for sure that we can trust him. So the next stanza in this song brings us to our final scene and our final point this morning. Our God invites us to see the future. Our God invites us to see the future. From verses 8 through 10, let's read that together again. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has brought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now these words, come behold, tell us that we are catching a fresh vision of reality. We are being called to see something that is remarkable, to witness something that will be awe-inspiring. Psalm 46 introduces for us a new story of reality. In the face of our troubles, God in His grace peels back the veil of history. He shows us the end to strengthen His church in the present. So what is this vision of the future which supercharges God's people in the present? What does God want His people to see with all inspiring clarity so that they can take heart and live with guts in the midst of chaos? The first thing that we see about the future is that it is God's work playing out on the landscape of history. God is not absent from history. This all belongs to Him. He is doing what He wants to do. The all-wise, all-loving, all-righteous, perfect, unchangeable God is running the show. This is His world, His story, and His works. Our job is to watch and worship. The second thing we see about this vision of the future is that God himself will be the one to bring about desolations upon the earth. The destruction will be from God's hand. God is going to wreck things. And when he finishes with all his destruction, all wars will be done and every instrument of pain will be broken forever. The third thing we see is that God will interrupt what feels like the natural flow of history. God is going to come like a thief in the night and yell, stop! Now, be still, as I'm sure that many of you have learned this verse, is a good translation as long as we know who God is talking to and the tone of His voice. Probably cease or stop or be still is the way that we should read Psalm 46, verse 10. Either way, one of the things that we're being called to do here in the context of this passage is to come and behold the works of God. And one of these great works is that on the last day, God is going to break in and He is going to stop the madness. One day, God is going to say, enough is enough. Over these last few weeks, We've tried a few times to play games with people over a video chat. And one of the games that we have played is Scategories. It is a game that has a time limit with a buzzer. You get focused, you're trying to write down as many words as you can, and every single time when the buzzer goes off, pop! It just catches you by surprise. You can almost hear everybody who's playing the game with you gasp because there's no warning. It just abruptly stops. That's it. Time's up. That is how it's going to be on the day of the Lord. And those who are looking to the dawn of Christ are going to love that sound. They're going to love that sweet sound of the trumpet. But those who were busy, 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 scurrying around trying to build their own kingdoms, that sound is going to make them gasp in terror. The fourth thing that we see is that once God decimates the earth, and yells, stop, he is going to impose himself in a way that he never had before. 
everyone who had belittled him, everyone who had spent their whole life trying to play God, and every city who thought that they were more important than the city of God, will finally know who the real God is. God is God, and the whole universe will know it. And the final thing we see in this song is that not only will God impose himself, but he will exalt himself. Not only will pe- people finally see that he is God, but they will see him in all of his wonder and beauty and glory and splendor. His glory will shine. All the idols of the world will be cast down. All the things that captured our attention will seem dingy. All of the inter- entertainment that we enjoyed will seem shallow. The old hymn And the things of earth will grow strangely dim and the light of his glory and grace will come true on a scale of cosmic proportion. So why is all this the vision that we need in the midst of our trouble? How does it help the church to see this future? Because while every other city will go up in flames, the city of God will shine bright like the sun. While it seems that the world is in utter chaos, it might just be that God is the author of this chaos and that any day now he may break in and finish this craziness by his power and for his glory. So when you find yourself in trouble, it is merely practice For the greatest day of trouble, the day of the Lord. When your life gets interrupted, it is merely a trial run for the great interruption, the day of the Lord. When some suffering comes into your life and catches you like a thief in the night, it's simply a dress rehearsal for that day when the trump sounds and the glorious resurrected Christ descends. What Psalm 46 is trying to teach us is that we should see all of our life-altering trouble as fire drills. You know, you practice lining up, you follow the protocol, you prepare yourself for the real thing. Now think about this. Schools wouldn't do fire drills if schools never caught on fire. Fire drills would be absolutely pointless if there were never any fires. But the biggest mistakes that we can make is to believe that Jesus was lying when he said that the day of the Lord would come upon us like a thief in the night. It is like the school that quits doing fire drills, only to end up having a fire that ends in a tragedy that could have been avoided. Every interruption, every trouble, every surprise suffering in your life is actually a grace from God to prepare you for the great day of the Lord. When he brings devastating and halting trouble upon anyone who has not put their trust in Jesus. If God rips the things out of our lives that we trust instead of Jesus, it might feel like he is killing us, but he will actually be saving us. If your life has been interrupted over the last eight weeks or you have been inconvenienced in any way, Maybe God is mercifully allowing you to prepare for the greatest interruption of all. Be still and know that I am God will either be the good news that we have desperately longed for or it will be the tragic ending to our existence. I will be exalted among the nations will either be the cry of our hearts and the mission of our church, or it will be the final announcement that all we tried to accomplish in our own strength and for our own glory was a total waste of time. If this is the future, then how gracious of God to let us in on it. We can cease our striving before God forces us to. We can exalt Him among the nations before he imposes himself upon the earth. Remember the words of Jesus. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, 
as we move towards our conclusion this morning, you may have noticed that we skipped over verse 7. And that is because it is repeated here in verse 11. In music, when a stanza is repeated like that throughout a song, we call it the chorus. The chorus is repeated for emphasis. Uh, The chorus draws together the whole song into a unifying theme. And the chorus is supposed to be what's left ringing in our ears. So what is the chorus of this song? What is the unifying theme? How does our God help us to bring Him glory in our times of trouble? We read it in verses 7 and verses 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. See, what we have to reckon with is that this supercharge of encouragement in Psalm 46 is filled with both some of the most compassionate language about God in the Bible and it is filled with some of the most terrifying language about God in the Bible. How can that be? How can that be the same God who is at the same time a very present help in trouble and he's flipping over chariots and lighting them on fire? How is it possible that he can be a river of delight making glad his people and he can be a voice that melts the earth? Well, I think it's brought together for us here in the chorus of this song. The Lord of hosts is with us. Who is God? He is God. He is Lord. He is the king of angel armies. He has promised to destroy the earth. And yet that God is with us. That God says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When the angel came to Joseph, to tell him that Mary was to be with child in Matthew chapter 1. It says, She shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then Matthew adds this comment. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. God isn't just with us in some sort of sentimental way. He isn't just sending good vibes towards us. God came down with us. Jesus Christ is God with us. And he experienced the worst trouble of all. He took our sins upon himself on the cross. He got as much in our trouble as we are. Our troubles became his trouble. And this terrifying God who has promised to destroy the earth brought about desolation. He destroyed the body of Jesus on the cross out of compassion for us. So Christians have a resource in Jesus Christ to deal with our life-altering trouble in a totally different way than the world. We don't have to ignore our trouble like the Stoic. We don't have to blame others for our trouble like the Cynic. We don't have to idolize our trouble like the Panic. And we don't have to go numb in the midst of our trouble like the Addict. With Jesus We get to glorify God in our trouble because He is with us. There really are only two options in life. Belong to the city of God or belong to the city of earth. Trust ourselves and die or trust in Jesus and live. If we mock His grace, If we give a stiff arm to his benevolence, we will regret it. But if we cease our striving and give up on being the stoic or the cynic or the panic or the addict, then Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, 
will be our mighty fortress through any and all of our most terrible troubles. Martin Luther paints the picture for us so well in that hymn that I mentioned. And so I want to close this morning with a stanza from his hymn. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he, the Lord of hosts, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Let's pray together. God, we know that we live in a world that is constantly being turned upside down. Things in nature, things among the nations. God, it seems like life is just constantly in an uproar. As soon as we seem to be settled, as soon as we seem to be resting, things catch us like a thief in the night. And so God, I pray that our hearts would be prepared, would be ready to welcome Jesus when he comes, that even now we would pray with the scriptures, come Lord Jesus, God, we are ready, we need you. And so even as we look to the future, even as we believe the things that you've promised, God, help us to believe right now that you are a very present help in our trouble. Lord, we praise you. You alone are God. And it is our desperate desire to trust you above all earthly powers, to enjoy you above all other earthly riches. God, you are the longing of our heart. So we cry out to you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.